Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Polynesia podcast, the show where we dive into the latest information and treatment options for non-small cell lung carcinoma. I'm your host Vivian, and today I'm joined by Tiffany. <laughs> hey, are you all right? You have been coughing for a while now. Um, I don't know. I've been feeling a bit off lately. You know, a persistent cough can be a sign of lung cancer, which we discussed in our previous podcast episode. Have you thought about go and get a body checkup? Cancer, lung cancer, is it difficult to diagnose? Well, it depends. But lucky for you, today we have a special guest who can address your concerns. Doctor Chen, a clinical oncologist from a public hospital. Is here to talk about the diagnosis, clinical trials, and also the treatment options for the lung cancer. That's great. I have many questions. Are there any choice for therapy? What are the advantages and disadvantages? Are there any? Hey, Tiffany, stop that. Why don't we just jump into the interview between our teammates and Dr. Chen? This is our pleasure to meet Doctor Chen today, and could you please say hi to our audience? Yes. Hello, everybody. I'm very glad to meet you all, our young generation, and also the scientific staff to be. <laughs> and we all know that you are a knowledgeable and experienced doctor、mm-hmm. now working in the public hospital.、Mm-hmm. So we believe that you have faced many different cases related to cancer.、Mm-hmm. So could you please show us us the biggest challenges you have encountered in your career life? So、um, during the diagnosis of disease,、um, the biggest challenges is that we would like to detect the disease at a very early stage because it can be curative intent. However,、um, the patient always present with symptoms, and by that time, already very terminal disease. And what we have, we can give is actually for disease control only. And secondly,、uh, for diagnosis of disease.、Um, Some patient they present with cancer of a non-primary, and we never know the origins. And we just base on the histology findings and also the morphology and also some of the IHC to make the diagnosis. And、um, thirdly, is sometimes the patient didn't even didn't have any accessible site for biopsy, or even we take the biopsy is inconclusive to make the diagnosis. So I, they are all the challenges that、uh, we are encountering diagnosis of disease. But because as you know, no,、uh, the pathological diagnosis indeed can determine the、uh, systemic therapy. And what are the challenges? Bigger challenges that we are facing when we do treating the cancer. Is that uh, uh, first of all,、um, the, sometimes the patient will present with a very aggressive disease, rapidly progressive disease with imminent liver or multi-organ failure, and that will limit the treatment options. Or indeed, we have to buy time to start the treatment as early as possible. And、um, secondly, the patient already in visceral crisis at with the metastatic disease, like. Indeed, for the lung cancer,、um, most of them when they present with us already stage three or stage four disease, and if they have visceral crisis, we indeed didn't have many options, because sometimes the patient, if the liver is already very deranged, that it probably cannot give any kind of chemo, or the renal function is very deranged, we probably cannot give any kind of chemotherapy. And fortunately, there are some molecular genetic testing or profiling that. We can give more options for the patient. However, it all really depends on the general condition as well as the、uh, the organ function of the patient. So,、um, and also because, uh, uh, and also the、um, because as you know, there is many kind of, the cancer disease indeed nowadays with many kind of different treatment. So uh, uh, we have to offer the patients. Like immuno target therapy and also the systemic therapy, the conventional and like the chemotherapy, we have to go through very thorough discussions with the patient and let them know the toxicities, because as you know, when we start the treatment, there is an expected outcome or toxicities, then the patient may feel upset or even will complain to us. So that is the reason why we need to have very thorough discussion with them before、uh, any commencement of the treatment. Thank you so much. Of course, here. But、uh, since you've just mentioned the targeted therapy,、mm. to our knowledge, bisulfonate antibody is one of the targeted therapies.、Mm. And to our knowledge, the targeted therapy is mostly used in stage four of non-stress amyloid carcinoma.、Mm-hmm. 
and there are other examples like the TKI. Yep. And since we are not the experts in this field, could you please give us more information of this therapy? All right. Okay, nowadays we always talked about the personalized medicine. That means we have to know about the genetic profile of each type of the cancer disease so that we can in improve or facilitate the decision making of the clinician as well as the patient. And also we can more target to this genetics or this molecular uh, characteristic and to provide the most appropriate treatment for the patient. As for the lung cancer, when the patients present to us with a stage four disease or inoperable or very locally advanced disease that beyond any kind of the radical treatment, that we would check the uh, several markets like the EGFL, the ALK, the ROS one, as well as the PDL one. These four markets indeed would be un universally uh, applicable to um, to the lung cancer patient, especially for the non-small cell type and including the adenocarcinoma. If the patient really have this driving mutation EGFR, then we can think about first gen, second gen, or third gen EGFR, TKI, the tyrosine kinase inhibitor. Especially if the patient have the brain metastasis, then we can uh, suggest the patient to have the third line, uh, third generation uh, EGFR, TKI, indeed, even without a brain metastasis, without any financial concern, then we would suggest a third gen uh, EGFR, TKI as well. If the patient has the ROS1 uh, to be a uh, uh, positive disease, a mutatious disease, then we, uh, we can consider the ROS1 uh, together with the MET inhibitors or the ROS1 uh, together with the NTRAC inhibitors like the NTRATINIP, uh, but with the very durable controlled indeed. And if the patient has the ALK uh, the positive disease, then we can uh, consider the ALK inhibitor. So you may argue with the whether the pa if the patient really didn't have any driving mutations, then what can they do? That is the reason why we put on we check the PDL one status, because if the um, if really all negative in the old days, we would just consider palliative chemotherapy like the conventional one, the TC, the Jamsa carbo, or even we can think about a lean to carboplectin. Uh, but nowadays, if the patient really have PDL one one to ninety at 49 percent then we can think about adding immunotherapy on top of the chemotherapy and then if it's more than or equal to 50 percent then why don't we just put on a single agent uh, immunotherapy so there are several options uh, that we can consider but it's really based on the genetic prof the molecular profile of this patient so um in recent years you have to say uh uh, we quite advocate the use of the NGS at the at the presentation, and w when the patient present to you with a metastatic uh, lung cancer, and there is a project going on which is supported by the university and also government as well. So um, we hopefully more patient can benefit from uh, uh, these kind of the drugable mutations. So oh, Dr. Chen, you just mentioned a lot of information about the targeted therapy. Our oh. uh, project is mainly focused on the targeted therapy. So we would like to ask, what do you think of the most promising area in the uh, in the target of VIP and mm -hmm. why? So um, the further, what is the most interesting area in the target of therapy in the med? Like we used the tag, uh, lung cancer as an example. Mm -hmm. As you know, um, around 50% of the metastatic lung cancer, they may harbor some drive mutations, of which it's the well known one. Uh, but like the EGFL, they already have the target, a very well established target therapy. But however, there is some rare mutations, like not really rare, but common mutation. But currently, we didn't have very concrete or the ver not really very popular treatments like the RAS mutations, like the BRAF, like the HER2, um, like the RAT mutations, like the MAT mutations. Although I know that there's many clinical trials already going on, but it's worth further. Uh, uh, research or further investigation, see whether there is any other novel or new agents to target this particular rare mutations on, or not studied but commonly seen mutation. And also, you note know, that um, there are some mutations, uh, especially for the EGFL, that is a very well known one. The other exposures to the first gen or second gen TK, uh, EGFL TKI, uh, especially for those EGFL mutated metastatic lung cancer. Uh, after one year, they probably will develop the resistant cones. Then we'll check the T790M. If it's T790M uh, positive mutations detected, then we can consider such gen uh, uh, EGFR TKI. So resistant topic is actually 
one um, interesting research area that uh, worth uh, and risk like these young scientists to look into. So um, the mutation, some rare mutations, some common mutations, but not much drugs available, or epigenetics, or um, the resistance, indeed is an interesting area that you can look into, mm -hmm. especially for the lung cancer. Yeah, thank you. Okay. So also in research, yeah, there are so many different types of the scientific research, such as the antibody therapies, so do you have any suggestions of this kind of uh, scientific research? And how do you assess the effectiveness of the treatment? Oh, okay. So um, the, for the role of the scientific research in, uh, in using the antibodies um, therapies in different kinds of cancer, maybe we take the lung cancer and breast cancer as an example. Uh, for the lung cancer, uh, as what I've told you like a couple of minutes ago, uh, there's a PDL one inhibitor. Like we, what we use is commonly used is the pembrolizumab or atezolizumab or lefolimab. They're already very well established one in the use in in, in uh, treating the metastatic lung cancer patients. No matter some, we need to depend on the PDL one status. Some, just regardless of the PDL one status, we just if the patient present with you with their non small cell lung cancer, that you already can give it, a say, in the second eye setting. Or if the squamous cell carcinoma, you can just put it in the, fa in, in the first line settings in addition to the chemotherapy. And then there's an other antibody therapies that will commonly use in the lung cancer is the bevacizumab. You may you may heard about this. It's actually an anti uh monoclonal antibodies uh, for the non squamous lung cancer, uh, and also when, especially for the adenocarcinoma, if the patient has the EGFR mutation positive disease, already exposed to the EGFR TKI befell, that we can think about uh, using the uh, bevacizumab, the anti VEGF, the monoclonal antibodies together with the immunotherapy like the AT cell, and in addition to the chemotherapies like using texocarbol or alimtocarboplectin. So according to the EMPOWER study. So we can add on this combo treatment so as to improve the outcome, improve the response rate, and also improve the, uh, the survival of the patient. And also probably to achieve a better durable uh, disease control. Taking breast cancer as an example, there are several promising um, scientific researches on using antibodies conjugates or antibody therapeutics in treating, no matter it's early stage of metastatic breast cancer. Um, for example, for the um, TDM one, which is tricyclic exam stain, it is an antibody drug conjugate. We probably is a new term to you guys. It's actually target the HER2, um, the, the HER2 signaling pathway, and as well as in combination with the chemotherapy. So it will share the chemotoxicities as well as some kind of the targeted uh, toxicities. Uh, for the TDM one, it can be used in the second eye settings uh, in a metastatic breast cancer after they felt the pertuzumab and tricizumab together with the chemo, or we put in an early stage disease when, especially for those patients who cannot achieve complete remission after the new adjuvant ke uh, uh, chemotherapy and also the target therapy. It hopefully to improve the disease free survival for this group of patients. And then another very commonly used one is the uh, pertuzumab, which is indeed a monoclonal antibodies, which target the, uh, uh, the HER2 demorization. Uh, it will combine with the use of the tricizumab, which is Herceptin. It's the most conventional, just like the first generation anti therapy. therapy. Um, no matter in the new adjuvant settings, that is pre-op settings or metastatic settings, according to the Kilpatrick trial, as well as the new spheres or Trifena studies, it did improve the outcome when we compare we use the single agent tricizumab alone. And then another agent is the um, cetuzumab uh, graviticin, so it's tuzumab graviticin, which is the very, very new agents. It is also the antibody drug conjugate, which we can be used for the triple negative disease. As I've told you before, all the triple negative disease is indeed the very aggressive tumor among all kind, different kinds of the breast cancer and with the poor prognostic factors. So we'd like to put on more treatment, give more options for this group of patients because they usually have poor response to the chemotherapy. So um, these new agents may give some hope to the patient, to the breast cancer patient. So we have to study more about the um, 
uh, the biologies of those signaling pathway and see if there's any new antibodies therapies that we can use for this uh, group of patients or any kind of the metastatic uh, cancer disease or even the early mm -hmm. uh, cancer disease. Yeah, right. thank you, Dr. Chen. Oh. And nowadays, there are many new therapies coming out at any second. So do you have any experience or example that you can share with us that an innovative therapy or treatment can significantly or at least at a certain level improve the patient's health conditions? All right. In order to advance the flight against the cancer and for more new agents um, that will be more interest into your research work, then you can think about any kind of the combination therapies, although there are already some going on and already in use, like the, what I've told you, the doublet double chemo together with the antifagive um, monoclonal antibodies together with the immunotherapy, but you can think about more mm -hmm. about like the combination to use of any kind of the monoclonal antibodies together with the immunotherapy that and then secondly, we can think about how to overcome the resistant cone, because as you know, there's like the cancer about the cancer disease, some good response, some clones, they didn't have very good response probably. Would, that, would it be possible that there are some kind of interesting mutations going on that we can think about, or we can uh, find out more new agents to target this resistant cone. And also there is many new immunotherapy agents that already some already in use like the CAR T and I'm, I noted that there is some T cell uh, immunotherapy there's still um, studies going on and you can think about some cancer vaccine as well so I think all like the HPV vaccine that is uh, always published nowadays in Hong Kong so I think there's different types different kinds of the cancer vaccine that you can think about and worth more studies so as to, to like the preventive measures uh, prevent the disease. All right. Okay. Yeah. So how to assess the yeah. efficacy of these new agents or these, um, no matter if it's antibodies, therapeutics, or this new target therapy, we shouldn't go through different steps. The preclinical settings, we really need all young mm -hmm. uh, scientists help us to find out more new agents, to find out more new signaling pathway uh, in the cancer treatment. And then after the preclinical settings, then we have to do some clinical trials, the phase one, phase two, phase three studies. Uh, and also the next is that we have to gather the real world data, the real world evidence before the implementation of all these kind of agents. So after all these preclinical studies, the clinical studies, trials, and then the real world, real world data, then it will go through the, all the different international guidelines and then to go through um, uh, the, like the FDA and then the CFDA, the China indeed they have the FDA as well. And then before we really uh, put in our real clinical practice. All right, of course, in our university settings, our university hospital, we have more opportunities to try the new agents. Uh, I like the clinic, we can, but our patients can join the clinical trials and then um, even is not approved in Hong Kong or it is not, we basically we prefer more new agents to approve the FDA before we really suggest the patient to use. But even before approval in Hong Kong, H8 or the DH settings, then uh, we may suggest a patient as well under the name patient basis. All right. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Chen. Yes. As you just mentioned about the clinical trial, mm -hmm. uh, some people that are happy to participate in clinical trials, but some of them maybe worry about like the adverse effects, yep. the life threatening effects, mm. or other following healthy issues. So, based on that, um, what's your opinion on that? Would you still encourage them to join the clinic? Um, there are several patients that we were more encouraged, we were kind of encouraged them to join or support them to join the clinical trials, mm -hmm. like the disease that really have limited treatment options. So the cl clinical trials indeed can, is a very important that we can study the new treatments and also to put into the clinical use. So, uh, and also the clinical trials indeed is help to assess the safety and also the efficacy of these new agents. Uh, but we need to need the patient support. So how can we advise the patient to work on or to cooperate and join the study with us? First of all, um, clinical trials indeed is a very good way and very vigorous and systemic way to let a patient access to the new treatment, especially for those treatments that 
th those patients with limited treatment options based on its disease, or he or she has already felt the conventional treatment, there's no more other options than she can ha join the clinical trial. And thirdly, it's the both patient who is really financially tied. They cannot pay for any new agents or even the SFI, the, the self finance items are currently available in the market. So we can um, encourage them to join our study. And then secondly, uh, apart from the access to the new agents, indeed, uh, we got mutual benefit. It can advance our medical knowledge and it can enrich our data as well. Because we got, we need to know more about the clinical data. We need to know more about the toxicities, especially in our localities. As you know, the phase one, the phase two trials, usually they will perform in the Caucasian or in, the, in, in other countries, it's indeed, instead of the Asia. Then when we have the experience in using these new agents with a very comprehensive protocol, that it may be good for our clinicians to get more familiar with these new agents and how to monitor the disease, the disease and help the patient experience. All right. Of course, the patient empowerment is actually very important. How can we engage them? Is that we have to go through very thorough discussion. We have to tell them uh, different treatment options. We have to offer alternative because we have standard, of, standard care, we have standard treatment. And then we hand to them some preliminary data from these clinical trials, how he or she may benefit. But equally importantly, we have to let them know about the toxicities. Because if there is an expected outcome, unexpected um, side effects, they may not accept it, right? So I think after all this thorough discussion and after the detailed explanation, then to, uh, once they get, get up their consent and then we go for some plea screening process, if they're eligible, then to most of them will agree to join our study. All right. Well, yes, thank you, Dr. And uh, just as you mentioned, uh, some patients may be, have some financial problems that they cannot afford the current treatments. Mm. And it, since our project is focusing on bispecific antibody, yeah. do you think the development of bispecific antibody can improve this situation or but it had other uh, potential impact on oh. cancer treatments. Okay. In particular for the lung cancer that your team interest and concern, um, the about the bispecific uh, to therapy, therapies indeed will hold a very great potential for the treatment. Like for the lung cancer patients, there is some use of the bispecific therapies to target the immune uh, immune um, uh, targets like the pd one and also the CL, ctl 4 These two molecules in this will help to suppress uh, the suppress the immune response to the cancer cells. So if we got the inhibition of these two uh, molecules, then probably can help to facilitate or activate our immune system to, to kill the cancer cells. So by blocking this, we, the bi-specific antibodies, we strongly believe that can help to uh, activate the, him, uh, the immune system and uh, increase the abilities to control the cancer disease. And then I had got an experience recently that a patient who got the uh, EGFR uh, elevated mutated uh, metastatic lung cancer, and then he'd exposed to the third gen um, uh, EGFR TKI. However, after several months, he's got progressive disease. I checked the NGS again. We noted that the patient have to met amplification. So at a time, we based on some clinical trial support, why don't we just try to put add on the met uh, the inhibitors, uh, the cap cap met kept in together with the uh, uh, third gen um, uh, EGFR TKI, hopefully can control to achieve the better control of the disease and we give the patient one more chance instead of just we put on the chemotherapy. So as you know, um, there is a certain amount, like five to 20% of the EGFR elevated um, uh, um, a metastatic lung cancer that may harbor this resistant mutation, the MET amplification. So I think all this area worth a detailed and further investigations uh, on those uh, by specific no matter if it's the antibodies or any molecules in treating no matter it's lung cancer or any kind of the um, uh, different kinds of the cancer disease. So it will 
looking forward to reaching yeah, yeah, another yeah. Uh, we, we are looking forward to um, uh, to seeing these patients again and see whether is she got a good response. How, unfortunately, the patient had very brief fall toxicities. Uh, maybe think probably because of it, her general conditions is not actually very good. But indeed, both agents they carry a lot of toxicities. When they combine the use of it, when they got a diarrhea, then it may affect the uh, organ functions like the renal function. Yeah, so we have to be very cautious when we put on these two new agents together with very close monitoring. Yes. All right. Yeah, then we can move to our final part. Oh, yeah. So because we know that being a doctor will be a very busy job because oh. there are so many patients you need to take care of and you still need to choose the most suitable plan for them. Oh. So we would like to ask what kinds of the channel can help you to stay the updates or the latest research and the advancement of the treatment plan of any other cancer treatment plan? Mm, it's a very good question indeed. And everybody's asked us, why, why you're so busy, but you have to yeah. you have lots of these updates. Uh, because it's actually an era of the internet information and you can, we have many different ways to access to the very updated information. It's like, first of all, we can join some, we, we, we can take a look into the up today. Mm -hmm. They have you know, there's an up-to-date app, uh, okay. up-to-date apps that we can, uh, there's several updates of the new treatment and then they will pop us and it will let us know what is the new agents and with what evidence behind. And then uh, this is some software that we can get access to. And secondly, we have to keep ourselves updated to look into the international guidelines, like the NCCN guidelines, like the ASMO guidelines, like the ATSCO guidelines. We have to look into all these guidelines because all these guidelines, they approve the use of those agents or put these new agents into the um, into their guidelines. They have to based on a lot of clinical evidence. So we will, we will, we will take all these guidelines as a reference. And sometimes we have to revise our department guidelines based on all of this as well. And then we have, can join some um, International Cancer Congress, like the East Mode as called, they have the annually Congress. So we can actively join all these sections and then to keep ourselves updates. Mm -hmm. Of course, sharing with our colleagues is very important because we have daily, we have weekly meetings and then we can meet because different people, they will specialize in different cancer disease. And then we, a active sharing um, is really very important as well no matter for ourselves and also for our next generation, the training as well. So apart from yourselves and because uh, we are a uh, university student, oh. so do you think, uh, do you have any advice can suggest us how to stay to the latest update for the mm. third and any other case I should In the old days, several decades ago, when I'm medical students, I have to have very good basic knowledge about what the science, the anatomy, the physiology, before we go to the clinical years. And after I get into the clinical years, then I have to look into many textbooks mm -hmm. and then we have to keep ourselves updates to look into the guidelines as well, you know, mm -hmm. no matter, because at that time we have to go through the medical, the surgery and different specialty. We can look into the specific guidelines to grasp mm -hmm. the, the treatment of the common disease, all right? And then once you get into this, become a specialist like me, I'm the clinical oncologist specialist, I really have to update myself uh, flew different channels like the internet, the pop map, and also we can look into the international journals like the um, New Journal of New England Journals of Medicine and um, or the JCO because the specific disease they will have different um, oh different different journals that are specific for like we have radiation oncology that are specific journals as well we have to take a look into it. Because different RT techniques, no matter the chemotherapy, indeed the RT techniques, they have, uh, they're getting to be more advanced te technologies that we have to learn. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then we have to um, keep ourselves updated with the international guidelines, as what I've mentioned, the East Mode, the S Code, the NCCN guidelines, especially NCCN there. Very many, many new agents already incorporated into these guidelines. And then to, uh, as a student, then you have to ask your senior, like Professor Lee, you have to ask him more about, oh, because the, the professor or your senior probably have more innovative ideas. 
about what is the new agents because they can get a, get a very good basic knowledge and then they keep abreast with what is actually going on and what is the most hot topics in the research area. So you can have more sharing with your senior, with the manager, and uh, I strongly believe that after you get your own update and then sharing with your colleagues, with your senior, and then it will make you a better person as a young scientist. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. I strongly believe that many of you are better scientists yeah. than I do because I already put out the science for a long, long time as a clinician. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I do, do believe your information can invite mm -hmm. up, even our audio. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, hopefully. And if there's no other questions, I believe this is the end of our interview. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you so much for being our guest today, Dr. Chen. And we can well, all see that you're such a knowledgeable and kind doctor. Mm -hmm. And we all wish you a bright and happy mm -hmm. journey ahead. Thanks again for being our guest. Thank you so much. Thank you. To wrap up the content of this episode, Dr. Chen shared valuable insights on the challenges faced in real-life cancer cases, the applications of targeted therapy and bispecific antibodies in NSCLC. She also encouraged patients to participate in clinical trials and discussed the potential impacts of bispecific antibody development on cancer treatments. Finally, she suggested various channels for staying updated on the latest research and advancements in cancer treatments. To all our listeners, we appreciate your tuning in and hope you found this episode engaging. We are excited to bring you more stimulating discussion on the Pioneer podcast in the future. Thank you for your support and we will see you next time. Bye-bye! <laughs>